Okay, so first we want to talk about what languages in general. Um, you know, usually we kind of have the feeling, especially in the second language classroom, that language is nothing more than grammar uh, plus a little vocabulary. And that's it, that equals language. And we also kind of get the feeling that texts are much more important than just normal everyday speech. Um, what the linguistic evidence tells us, however, is that this isn't really the full story. Uh, linguistic evidence shows us that everyday speech really forms the foundation for higher literary skills, and everyday meaning is really important for um, getting a handle on abstract thought. What, we, what it also shows us is that language is social. Uh, it's communication in communicative contexts. Uh, it's about giving messages to other people. And so pri primarily language is something that is spoken and it's something that is social. And it's something that's about sense, you know, it's about our everyday sense of the world and it's about making sense. So what I usually do is, you know, ask people, if someone says the word apple to you, uh, what comes to your mind? What does it make you think of? Now, for most people, this is gonna be the image of the prototypical apple, you know, the mental image of that thing. And if I say the words crisp, juicy apple, and if I say mushy, wormy apple, you're gonna have a different internal experience of those words. So what we have is a concrete sense experience on the one hand, and that's becoming sense imagery that's connected to the meaning in our mind. And we represent that with a speech sound, in this case, apple. And that speech sound is represented by the text, A-P-P-L-E. Um, what I really wanna drive home in this is that the text symbol is really a representation of the vocalization or of the sound, apple. It's not directly representing an apple, it's representing the sound apple. And then we use the sound apple to uh, access the actual sense imagery of an apple. Um, now, a lot of research has been done on silent reading. And what they found is most of the time what we're doing is sub-vocalizing that and actually accessing meaning via our inner speech. So we're never really reading silently. And whenever we're producing our comprehending speech, these systems are all working together. Um, we're activating the same brain regions. We're using the same muscles even. Even if we're thinking silently or reading silently, they've done studies where they've attached, you know, mm, very sensitive uh, equipment to your vocal cords and they notice that they move in similar uh, ways. It's similar. And so all our sense and all symbol is mediated by voice. You know, all language is speech, whether that's uh, internal or external. And of course, the best way to get an internal sense of voice is by you know, in, uh, developing your sense of external voice first. It'll give you a good foundation. So when we're talking about traditional texts, um, they're really much closer to this primarily oral sort of sense. When we look at old texts, we notice that in most cases, in case of Tibetan, in case of Latin and other uh, writing systems, they don't use interword spacing and they don't use uh, punctuation. That's because, you know, most of these texts would be memorized and spoken out loud and studied in oral contexts, in social contexts with other people. So, uh, I just want to end here with a section on a Ternod quote. Uh, literary Tibetan is incomprehensible without the right pauses and accentuation. And I think we need to keep that in mind. What's really going to help us study Tibetan texts is if we get used to speaking them out loud and reading them out loud and engaging with them in a, in a way that maybe culturally we're not habituated to engaging with texts.